The southern border might be the hottest topic in the country these days. Once again, it's Biden versus Texas. And of course, the stakes couldn't be higher for people on both sides. You know the deal. You've read the headlines. But when you think about it, I would expect an absolute flood of movies that are set along the U.S.-Mexican border. And we've seen that to an extent. Not as many as you'd imagine, but a lot of these stories have a very specific point of view. You've got the near saintly immigrants just trying to get a better life, and you can't blame them for that. But then you have the evil border patrol agents who are making their lives miserable. How dare they? And then a film comes along like Bad Hombres, and it doesn't take a side at all. How cool is that? The new thriller is in theaters right now. It's also on VOD outlets if you can't find it at your neighborhood Cineplex. Check out Apple or Amazon for those VOD titles. And if I was an illegal immigrant who picks the wrong construction job, and this guy may pay the ultimate price for that. The film stars Diego Tinoco, Thomas Jane, Hemke Madera, who I haven't seen before, but he's very good in this movie. Great role, too. And, of course, Tyrese Gibson from the Fast and the Furious films. This one is lean. It's unpredictable. I love that about movies. But it's also woke-free. Trust me, woke-free. It is luxurious to watch a movie like that. And if you like B-movies with bite, well, Bad Hombres is exactly for you. It's why I reached out to the film's director, John Stahlberg Jr. He previously directed Muzzle. That one came out, I guess, mid-last year. Had Aaron Eckhart as a cop who's suffering from PTSD, working with a new canine partner. Very good movie, too. Something different. And I just love Aaron Eckhart. Great actor. So I thought, let's talk to John about Bad Hombres, find out what drove the decisions behind the film, and what his thoughts on filmmaking in general are. Hope you enjoy my conversation with John. Check out the interview. And then this weekend, go see Bad Hombres. John, thanks for joining the show. And I think before we begin, before we talk about Bad Hombres, I want to get a little bit of an origin story here. How did you get into filmmaking? And what was the, the biggest hurdle along the way? I'm assuming there was just one. Maybe there were a multitude of them. But obviously, you've made it. What, how did you get here? Wait, the hurdles are supposed to stop once you get started? <laughs> That's right. I, I, I feel like there's, <laughs> they keep getting larger and larger. Um, it's amplification wave of hurdles. I was born in Hollywood. Um, my parents were from New York, but they came out here. My dad's a forensic psychiatrist, and he ended up – he was a surfer, so he wanted to go to medical school somewhere where there was waves, and he applied to Hawaii, but he got into USC. I ended up being the product of uh, you know his uh, uh, medical you know journey, so I was born in Hollywood. And, you know, I, I sort of ended up finding my way into the into the business. I mean, I was obsessed with films ever since I was a kid, um, genre films specifically. But I grew up watching, you know, John Carpenter films and horror films and mm-hmm. all the stuff that was programmed on like the four channels that we had <laughs> growing up. Um, you know, and, and so you had a few choices. And back then it was the Wild West, like HBO was this, in its nascent stage. And they would put anything on TV. So I grew up watching, you know, The Thing or Remake and with, with Kurt Russell and you know, these kind of films and, and ended up um, just becoming obsessed with movies and especially movies that had, you know, a genre component. Sure. Um, you know, I, I sort of worked my way back to 70s movies and 80s movies um, uh, and, and films from the 60s. But, but I mean, typically, like what really made an impression on me was a genre film, uh, something with some some tension and uh, maybe a little bit of violence, some special effects makeup horror movies, that stuff just really started to intrigue me. I wanted to know, demystify it and find out how they made it. So I wasn't so terrified of all this stuff. So, you know, I was scared, I was scared, you know, like when I watched Halloween, I was terrified. So I wanted to figure out how they did it. And that's really what drove me to start making films as a kid. That's amazing. You know, it's funny when the pandemic struck around that same time, my wife was dealing with cancer. She's okay now, but as a, as an audience member, all I wanted to do was watch genre films. I didn't want dramas. I didn't want Oscar bait features. There was just something so visceral about genre films that I watched that completely. And I've still kind of, I mean, I've always loved those kinds of movies, but it's, it's I, I understand your affection for them. I think they're fascinating. Uh, you know, when you think about your new film, Bad Hombres, it's the kind of film you don't know what's going to happen next. And that's great as, a, as an audience member. But how did you get attached to the script? Just briefly tell that story. Because, I mean, obviously it seems like a good fit for you, but things sometimes fall into place in unique ways. Yeah, they really do. I mean, you never know which project that you've been working on or coming up with is going to be the one that goes or the one that goes next. Uh, the, the order can also just be surprising. But, you know, these ideas kind of strike you from time to time. I was 
in the process of working on a new house uh, in the Hollywood Hills. And uh, I hired a bunch of guys from Home Depot and sort of went through that experience of picking up these guys. And they just hopped in my car, these nice guys, we're taking them over to go, you know, work on some stuff at the house. And I just thought to myself, like, what if I was a serial killer? These guys just jumped in my car. They don't know who I am. And <clears throat> they just, you know, going along with me to this weird place. They don't know where they're going. And you know, I, uh, again, like I grew up in LA. So like we've had to deal with the notion of ever since I was a kid, I remember Ronald Reagan and immigration and illegal immigrants and, you know, my parents, like, uh, how they, their point of view on it and us having like a housekeeper who was like part of the family from, you know, El Salvador. And like, I just, so, so I've always been exposed to this notion of like mm. a porous border and people coming over here to work and whatnot. So, so that's always just been a part of that's living in Southern California. I came up with the idea, though, because, um, you know, that's the world out here. And that idea struck me. I pitched it to two guys, Rex Turner, uh, Nick Turner and Rex New, who um, are writers that wrote a script I was attached to. It was a wild, wild screenplay. It was like it had the energy of just like pure chaos. Mm -hmm. There were <clears throat> these guys who figured out a way to sort of. Uh, uh, on the page, at least, create uh, just an energy that I hadn't seen before. And a producer named Ahmed Zappa developed the script with these guys. And we couldn't get through the meeting because we were laughing so hard. Like the <laughs> script was so outrageous uh -huh. uh, and, 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 and in a brilliant sort of unhinged way. And so they immediately popped in my head as guys that I should pitch the idea to. So I pitched it to them and, and uh, we developed the screenplay together over a, maybe a year or two, just doing draft after draft. And we would, you know, eat uh, ramen soup over and over, and have these meetings. We're over ramen soup in LA, and 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 just uh, sort of hone the script down, and it changed a lot. And there was a lot of different permutations and drafts, and we sort of ended up where we ended up. But it was this kind of long, uh, wild, organic process that just yeah. sort of ended up working. You know, what I liked about the film is that it touches on a really hot button issue, obviously, and yet it didn't feel like a lecture. It didn't feel like you were saying this is good. This is bad. You were saying this is what it is. And then this story just flows from that. And I, was that something that was important to you that you kind of avoided taking a stand? Because I, I thought that was interesting about the project. I think I think anything didactic, any film that, quote unquote, takes a stand is immediately uninteresting to me and and not only that it it uh anything that feels like it's lecturing you or or being sort of um uh i don't know like almost like agitprop it's just like it starts to feel unartistic mm -hmm. like it's it's not uh, an artistic expression so what the situation at the border the the illegal immigration problem this isn't our father's Im illegal immigration problem or when i grew up this is something different and the amount of carnage violence and mayhem that's going on at the border is beyond comprehension. I mean, the media actually, as much as they cover it, bury a lot of the stuff happening right at the San Diego border. Uh, I mean, right with Tijuana, it's mm -hmm. absolute chaos and violence of a scale that is comparable to like, uh, you know, war crimes being condemned in the Hague. Like it's, things are going on down there. That's outrageous. I mean, they're killing, uh, cartels are killing entire journalist staffs and newspapers and it's all kinds of crazy stuff going on. So this is a ripe situation for uh, exploration artistically. That's that's how we looked at it. And this isn't the type of thing where we said this is a ripe opportunity to now uh, uh, push a political agenda mm -hmm. or – I mean obviously I have my own political beliefs and all that stuff is an expression – you know, that comes through the movie, but, but at the same time, it's, it's not to sort of like support policy or do this. It's, it's to make cinema. That's mm. the goal. But yeah. I have to make cinema from an honest place of how I see the world. And I happen to live in a part of the world that is experiencing some, some severe chaos. And it's because of this situation. Yeah. It's interesting. And you know, it's, it's almost surprising there, there aren't more stories tied to the border. We do see some from time to time and some are a little bit more luxury than others, but it, it, it's such a ripe subject and there's so much drama happening there, so much human suffering that it, that oh, yeah. it's, it, it's, you think it'd be even more storytellers kind of attracted to it. Oh, real quickly, I want to take a quick detour. I'm a bit of a geek and I was reading some of the credits and I thought I read, was it Oliver Hudson and Wyatt Russell? And I think they're part of the Russell clan is they were producers yeah. in the film. Anything you can share about that? I mean, obviously yeah, yeah, Goldie they're, and they're Cart, they're, they're royalty in a way. Yeah. Yeah. 
Oh, yeah. Yeah, absolutely. I mean, like I said, I grew up watching the Thing remake with uh, That's right. Russell that John Carpenter did. And then I ended up, um, you know, having the opportunity to, to work with Kurt in a movie mm-hmm. called Crypto uh, that I did, um, who, which also stars Liam. I mean, uh, Luke Hemsworth, uh, coincidentally. Um, so the uh, the guys are my producing partners uh, in a company called Slow Burn. And we've done a handful of films. We did Muzzle. We did Bad Hombres, we mm-hmm. did a film called Broke that hasn't come out yet with Wyatt and Dennis Quaid. It's a really, really, really good film. And, uh, you know, and we were about to start The Winter Kills with Kiefer Sutherland, but that got really sort of dismantled because of the, the strike. So they're, they're, uh, I just got off the phone with Oliver. He's also my partner in uh, our TV division. Mm-hmm. And we have a TV, TV deal at Fox that was just announced to do, uh, you know, drama, comedy, and uh, unscripted. And, and we're, so we have this company. We've been friends forever. Oliver's, uh, like uh, my best friend since mm. I was growing up and he was my neighbor across the street. So we uh, grew up together. We He's like a brother, you know, so we've been working and, and, and starting this company together has been amazing because, you you know, you start to you realize you start to kind of grow apart from even your best friends as you get into adulthood and mm. children and wives and ex-wives and all this stuff. And 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 having a company forces us to talk and hang out and have breakfast. And we talk every day multiple times. And so it's it's awesome. We're yeah. able to hang out with your, your best friends. So it's it's great. Excellent. You know, one of the things I've noticed about your films is there are scenes that I think another filmmaker would shoot in a more aggressive way, a more stylish way. You have a kind of a, a, a subtle approach where it, it takes you by surprise. It's different, but it doesn't draw attention to itself. I'm kind of curious, were there filmmakers you watched growing up that you – wanted to modulate or kind of, uh, you know, mimic their approach? Is this something you focus on where you think maybe your colleagues would go this way, but you zag that way? What's just as, from a, a visual point of view, how would you describe your approach? Uh, well, it's funny that you call you might be the only person to ever call me subtle, <laughs> but, but, uh, but I understand what you're saying and I understand the question. I appreciate that. I mean, I tried to, I mean, like I mentioned John Carpenter, uh, when you watch a film like Halloween that terrified us, I remember showing it to uh, some younger kids with my friends. I think it was Oliver's kids. And we were showing it to them and they were like, seriously, guys, this is the most boring movie of all time. Oh, <laughs> no. <laughs> they were like so bored. And I'm like, why? And you realize like the shots were very slow burn and mm-hmm. Michael Myers slowly appearing in the darkness behind Jamie Lee Curtis. And, and there were these things that are, that forced you to reconsider the frame. And, you know, a lot of French filmmakers would do that where it's, it's, uh, you know, uh, an approach that's, that's slightly more organic and allows mm-hmm. the audience to sort of make, become the editor and become, become involved, become immersed in the story because you're holding a shot longer than is necessary. I mean, you know, the famous moments are like, you know, Martin Scorsese in Taxi Driver, that shot of the Travis Bickle looking at the ice cracking in his cup mm-hmm. uh, in the diner. And Thelma Schoemaker said like, oh, well, shouldn't we shorten this, Marty? And he said, no, long, elongate. <laughs> like, make it twice as long. And then you really start to wonder as the ice is cracking, like, what's going on? Wait, why are we watching this shot? And so it starts to become like this engaging thing. And look, we're not making films that are $200 million 3D movies that are sort of intrinsically Im- immersive. And so how can we, with no money and no time, create a similar kind of thing where the audience starts to go, what, 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 why are we in this bathroom? What's mm-hmm. going on here? What's happening here? And once you start doing that, uh, uh, again, you're becoming reeled into the story somehow. So it's a device. I also think it's, um, you know, it's it, it's a way to artistically express yourself in like a unique and interesting way. I think if had I shot that sequence, the the horrible Steve Hoskins sequence, home invasion sequence mm, in the mm. film, had I shot that, just in particular, um, the way that you would sort of, <clears throat> quote unquote, typically shoot it, had I done a steady cam in front of him and then a steady cam behind her from his kind of subjective point of view, chasing her. To, you've seen it before. Yeah. You've, yeah. You, I, you've seen it a hundred times. So suddenly that scene becomes like sort of trite and familiar. Whereas like if I could come at it from a, an approach that not only dovetailed with our very, very minimal budget and again, 15 day shooting schedule, which was yeah. bananas, almost impossible to figure out. Yeah. Then, then, uh, uh, you know, again, it, it would, it would be boring if I did it the typical way and I couldn't do it the typical way. So I had to solve this problem and I solved it through being artistic and free and reminding myself every day, 
oh, you can just tell this story any way you want. There's no one at a budget this low, this small. There's no one looking over your shoulder telling you what to do, yeah, which is great. That's no, no studio off. notes. And by the way, no, so um, meaning, a, meaning a studio would have forced me to shoot coverage of these <laughs> scenes of, of 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 Steve waking up in the desert with the pickaxe, or Steve in the house. These kind of, mm. you know, these scenes where you don't see things happening and actions happening off camera. They would have never allowed that. You know. Two quick thoughts. One, I think yeah. you're trusting the audience with not not every filmmaker does that, and also. Uh, I bet you Oliver Hudson's kids, when they get older, I bet you if they rewatched Halloween, they may appreciate it in a way they didn't the first time around. Because I, I, I think as you get older, you you have an uh, appreciation for uh, subtlety, for sophistication, for those scares. Yeah. I, I just think I, think, I like I like Michael Myers when you barely see him, as opposed to the more recent films where you see him a lot. I just think I can't agree scare. more. Yeah, uh, I, I literally I couldn't agree I couldn't agree more. Yeah. And I mean, listen, you, you can't, once you introduce him, you can't not have him in the film in such regularity. But I, I did miss the, the, that approach in the first film. You, you, you hinted yeah. at the, the, the short running time here. And I've talked to a lot of filmmakers and they, you know, independent filmmakers, they don't have the budget. They don't have this. They don't have that. And they often have to improvise. They have to get creative. And I know in a perfect world, you'd have an unlimited budget. But is there something, is there something that supercharges your creative engines when you have such a limited budget, a limited scope, a limited time. Does that in some way become a benefit? Yeah. In a way, I want to say, don't quote me on this because it's <laughs> like you, you, you want, you want as much money as you can exactly. uh, get your hands on to make mm-hmm. a film. However, it's the Jaws log rule. I don't know if you ever read the book about the making of Jaws. The Jaws log is a great book, but Steven Spielberg would not have come up with the yellow barrels and Jaws unless the shark didn't work. Right. Oh, I didn't know that. The obstacle. Yeah. So the obstacle. Oh, you should read this book. I mean, the <laughs> obstacles that you encounter, whether it's budgetary, budgetary uh, obstacles, schedule obstacles, um, anything, they they force you. They do. They force you to be creative. I mean, apparently, like they would have these days where they would shoot nothing on Jaws. The shark wasn't working, and John Milius would come over for dinner. Uh, I might be getting it wrong, but and and come up with the USS Indianapolis speech, mm-hmm. you know, and and so and that whole scene where they're you know Dreyfus and them are, are comparing scars in the boat. Um, she broke my heart, you know. <laughs> and so they the the obstacles when you're making film, you have two things you can do: you can fold and you can go home, or you can figure it out. And I think one of the first things that happened was they said, John, look, you, you we're cutting your days. We're cutting your schedule. The budget is, is almost nothing. We made the movie for two and a half million dollars. So oh it, was, yeah, it was, it was almost nothing. And they said, look, don't direct the film. You, you, this is going to be, this is, you're going to be disappointed. There's no time and you, you won't be able to pull it off and you can't do it. And, and I, for that night, I considered just stepping aside and then the whole term sequence popped in my head i was like what what if i decide to do it how could i do it could i make this and i thought well how would i do that home invasion scene that whole sequence is a day mm-hmm. and they're saying to shoot it in half a day and so I, I you know i don't know how i could do that and then i thought well what if the camera just doesn't what if we never leave the bathroom and then all of a sudden it like it, it was like an explosion went off in my head of if i approach the whole film like that things happening off camera and mm-hmm. things happening kind of behind you with sound design and, 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 and all of a sudden the whole thing just became extremely interesting. And I wouldn't have had that sort of weird filmmaking epiphany had I not been confronted with this like horrible financial reality, you know? That's so interesting. I want to briefly touch on your last film, Muzzle, which I, and I recommend as well. And that's about a, a cop. He's struggling. He's got PTSD. He's, he's working with his canine partner. He's got a lot of emotional issues. And I was curious you mentioned earlier about your dad and the work that your dad did. Does having that background in, in that capacity help you with the psychological portraits as a storyteller? I would think it would, but I'm, I'm kind of curious how that impacted your, your skills. Uh, 100%. I mean, my dad is a forensic psychiatrist who does criminal psychiatry. He does, uh, you know, essentially determining if someone's sane or insane, mm-hmm. um, capital murder cases, Supreme Court cases. Um so uh, death death penalty cases. So he's he, you know serial killers in L.A. He's worked. He's on all these sort of serial killer shows and mm. everything. So yes, um, in fact, he does the exact thing that Granger Hines does, interviewing this this uh, police officer involved, played by Aaron Eckhart, who's involved in an, an officer involved shooting, in these these sort of mandated psychiatric sessions. That's my dad's actual job. Like he's <laughs> done that with 
I only laugh because it's morbid, but but he he interviews police officers who are forced to see him from uh, uh, situations in which they they discharge a weapon and kill people, and so they, or, or police officers dealing with PTSD, um, how the character has in the film. So he's dealt with a lot of people, soldiers and and police officers that have PTSD. So when I showed him that scene, he he, it's funny because it influences me beyond c- comprehension. However, I didn't actually get his his advice on that scene like oh. it just just growing up talking to him and talking to him every day it's just it sort of imbued uh itself into the scene specifically but he called me and said how could you not call me about that scene <laughs> you know? and i said oh yeah I, that's right he goes that's ex- that's actually what i do you know <laughs> I, said, ah, I know and then he said uh um he said but i gotta tell you that is very accurate very <laughs> accurate <laughs> you did, did so you he's, he's known as we call him like yeah, it was really kind of a cool moment because I, I nailed that that gotcha. stuff. So so yes, but it does influence me because I, what I do is I focus just like he does on psychopaths. Mm. If you notice, through all my films, I deal with psychopaths. Even back to my first film that premiered at Sundance, Adrian Brody's character is called Psycho Ed. I mean, he's a psychopath. And, you know, this movie's got horrible, a lot of psychopaths. Sure, horrible sure. Steve Hoskins, sure. played by Paul Johansson, who, who nearly steals the movie, as some have said. And I think that's true. Uh, even Nick, Eddie's, I mean, they all in Tyrese clearly and, and Luke Hemsworth plays a great unhinged psychopath. So and, and you you could argue that Hemke Madera's character is a psychopath, mm-hmm. um, you know, or a reform, some man seeking redemption. A psychopath is there redemption for that sort of character yeah. of a psychopath. So That's- I'm obsessed with even in crypto. There are these Russian, uh, um, you know, kind of gangsters. And they're psychopaths and doing all kinds of psychopathic behavior. My dad's fascinated with psychopaths. In a clinical sense, in a clinical setting, I'm fascinated with psychopaths in a cinematic setting. That's that, the difference. That is fascinating. You know, I, we often hear a lot of terrible stories about Hollywood actors behaving badly, producers doing much worse. And I, listen, I focus on that. I'm, I'm, I cover this industry. But I also like to ask people like you who are working behind the scenes who are in this field for some positive stories. Uh, an actor going you know, above the call of duty to, to help out a colleague or just something – uplifting or did, did any stories like that uh, come to mind or i mean maybe there's too well, yeah i mean look I, I i think that the the what do they say the rotten apple spoils the bunch i mm-hmm. think that there's there's some terrible characters in any industry sure uh there you know i imagine uh, but in this business yes there are some people that are you know uh i mean psychopathic in their own sense and and, <laughs> and you know and, and and ridiculously indulgent and criminal and there's all kinds of stuff going on here there's and when you have a lot of money and a lot of fame and a lot of stuff and egos, and I think it was like Shane Black said, like it's as if somebody grabbed the East Coast and shook it, and all the sane people held on. Um, you know, it's like that's that's L.A. So and and this, and this business. However, I will say the people that I grew up with in uh, Hollywood, the people that introduced me um, into into the business, I mean, a guy like Kurt Russell, who I grew up just being like absolute idol uh you know and and such a fan of in all of his movies you know with all the john carpenter movies he did he did five of them big trouble in little china and all those movies he did were so great and you know escape from new york escape from la and you know he's like such a great guy and he ended up you know working as an actor in one of my films crypto and he uh even just recently on this film i'm, I'm gonna embark on a new a new project. Uh, it's a uh, script written by S. Craig Zoller, who wrote Bone Tomahawk. Oh my gosh! Brawl Cell Block ninety nine. Yeah, and Dragged Across Concrete. And it's a was, Western thriller. I was actually yes. going to compare you to him in in part of this conversation. It's so uh, funny oh, you brought him you? up. Yeah, because because he, he's uh, such a patient amazing. storyteller too, and I mean, and he works in genres as well. Right, and he tries to do what I try to do, which is elevate existing or pre existing mm-hmm. genres. Right, sort of work within genre so that you have. You have business partners that can make money and they can sell the movie because it is show business. So it's not just show. You need the business parts so they can go off and make money on the genre and they can sell it internationally. Mm-hmm. And then you can within there have sort of free reign to do something interesting and artistic and and try to elevate it. Um, and so, yeah, so I, I definitely am a huge fan of his. And so this this screenplay um, is, is just, you know, it's like a bone tomahawk. I mean, it's an incredible thing that I'm trying to working working on right now putting together and uh kurt russell who was in bone tomahawk wanted to have a read and 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 invited me over to his house and said hey come on over to my house i just want to spend 
the day with you talking about this project because I want to help you realize the, you know, the full vision mm -hmm. uh, for this thing. And it was just like this really selfless thing. And I said, yeah, sure. And he said, when are you free? And I said, uh, you know, I thought he was maybe just kind of being trying to be nice. And he said, how about tomorrow? <laughs> and I said, be, gr be great. And I went over to Kurt Russell's house and I spent, you know, seven or eight hours sitting with him, just going through the script. He had written out ideas and things and, and, and themes and, and notions about scenes and breaking them down. He didn't have to do that. You know what I mean? Yeah, and he yeah. did that. He did that because he loves film and he's a great guy. And he's a, you know, sort of a pater familia. You know, he's like this, this guy who wants to help young filmmakers. And I know that he did Bone Tomahawk for next to nothing. You know what I mean? He didn't have to do that either. So he supports good material. He supports good filmmakers. And he's just one example of, of many that I could name where, mm -hmm. where you'll see like incredibly selfless, um, uh, uh, menschy behavior from, from these great iconic guys in Hollywood. It's just, it's just maybe, uh, you know, it doesn't get publicized. Yeah, no, I that, that's why I wanted to ask about that because I, I do want to share some positive stories and that couldn't be any better. Uh, John, before I let you go, I want to ask you one last question about just the state of Hollywood right now. you got more streaming options than ever before. Then you have Hollywood is really tightening its belt in recent months as far as the budgets and, you know, streamers suffering lots of uh, subscriber loss. There's lots, of, there's lots of action going on. Do you emerge... Uh, optimistic about what you'll be able to do in the years to come? Are you a little afraid of, of things kind of closing down? How do you, how do you look ahead? You know, obviously the, the Kurt Russell project and all it, this it sounds amazing, but I'm just, just generally speaking as a storyteller in Hollywood, are you eager to kind of jump into the fray or are you worried about some of the forces that are uh, tightening around the industry? I'm definitely worried. Uh, I feel like the, the belt it feels like it can't get any tighter. Right. So when, when we talk about belt tightening and belt tightening again, like prior conversations, the, the films that I grew up on and when I was starting out in Hollywood as a PA would shoot for three months, you know, and they'd have a, essentially adjusting for inflation, like hundreds of millions of dollars in budget. And, have just a, a you know if a scene didn't quite work that you're shooting over four days mm -hmm. you know you you just say, shoot it again we're gonna shoot it <laughs> we're taking another four days to get that right you know uh, and you go back and watch these films like you go watch um the fugitive with harrison ford or you, you, know, you just it's sort of like you can't oh yeah hollywood used to make these just absolute giant films with unbelievable spectacle and it's it's kind of like we're forgetting how they used to do it. And now you have, you know, 12 days and you've got Sylvester Stallone being paid 4 million and he's going to show up for half a day and you shoot, <laughs> you know, eight pages of dialogue. And you're just like, this isn't movie making anymore. So yeah. in the indie space, you have to be very, very careful about, uh, um, it also like just the budgets and the schedules and the way that, that, that sort of these financial, uh, systems are sort of operating right now. In, a, in an unsustainable way, but also, frankly, the casts are unsustainable. There's just not that many movie stars, mm -hmm. uh, relatively speaking, yeah. in order to like put together these indie, indie projects. And that's why, you know, some of them have been, in a pejorative sense, called uh, geezer teasers, like where they have, <laughs> you know, uh, it was Stallone or this guy or that guy. Bruce Willis was famous for, for doing all of these things, but they would just sort of appear for one day in a film and they would just, you know, kind of shoot him out. And leverage him to get the movie made those things are really going the way of the dodo it's very difficult mm -hmm. and it's reached a point and i think the tipping point when we look back and have 2020 hindsight is going to be this film rust where it's like the the it was so squeezed on this production and so sort of mismanaged that people literally died the cinematographer was killed and the and the, the director was shot by the actor and that to me it's like you have to look at that for what it is these things are so off the rails mm -hmm. that the director and people are being killed by the actors on the set. This is happening in Hollywood, quote unquote. So there, there, if you can't acknowledge based on that, not you personally, but mm -hmm. people, that there's something fundamentally wrong with the indie space, 
then, you know, people just are ignoring the realities of it. So, yeah, I'm concerned. But yeah. I'm, at the same time, I'm still pressing forward. I'm optimistic about storytelling. It's what I know how to do. So. Yeah. Well, you know, given all the limitations, the short running time, the small budget, you made a movie like Bad Hombres, which is very good. And it is in theaters right now. And if it's not playing in a, in a movie house near you, you can order it on video on demand, Apple, Amazon. You can find it that way. To me, if you're sick of cookie cutter films and you want something that's fresh and exciting and different and raw, you're going to really like Bad Hombres. So, John, keep up the great work. Thanks for joining the show. And I really hope to talk to you again. I so appreciate it, Christian. This is, it's fun to listen to your podcast, even as a guest. I got to tell you, you're good at it. Oh, thanks. Take care now. Thanks for checking out a bonus episode of the Hitcast and come back on Wednesday for an all new show. And of course, please smash the subscribe button and make the Hitcast part of your podcast diet. Tastes great. Less filling. See you next time.